Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Today, uh, this is a great episode. If you were like me, you were fixated on uh, a docu-series called The Curious Case of Natalia Grace that really took hold of our imaginations last May. Well, you're going to start 2024 off right, because January 1st, we have six episodes spaced out over three nights of the return of the curious case of Natalia Grace, but it's very important. This is Natalia Speaks. We have Natalia Grace herself in her own voice walking us through her story that actually shows us that truth can sometimes be stranger than fiction. And of course, the recurring characters are put into place. You have Christine, Michael Bar Bar Burnett, the family. Uh, I watched the first five episodes. I still have not seen the sixth, and it is a ride, folks. It is a ride. I was so excited to watch this. But uh, the reliable narrator, as I call her, of these episodes is somebody that you're familiar with already. She is really, for me, at the top of her game as a legal analyst. When I see her pop up on my screen, I know that I can trust her. So this show really uses her to great effect. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Beth Karras. Beth, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Ryan. I hope I live up to everything you just said about me. I've been a fan of yours for so many years. I mean, you've covered so many high profile trials and you really help us understand the legal process because it is so hard to understand these things. And especially with this case, what do you think the fascination that we have with the Natalia Grace story is? Because I truly, I've talked to so many people that, that can't wait for this return of this docu-series. What, what do you think it has our imagination? So, you know, crime is a big genre, right, in, in podcasts and television. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the crime that gets um, made, the stories, are, are murders. And this is a nice departure from that, right? <laughs> uh, there may be abuse, but nobody's murdered. Thank God. But there's a, there are so many twists and turns, and we don't, we don't know what the truth is. And it all really all comes down to what the Barnetts did in June of 2012 in getting Natalia re-aged. Everything that happened to her after that, after they had her re-aged up 15 years from 8 to 22, I mean, changed the trajectory of her life. I mean, she's put in an apartment by herself. Whether she's a child or an adult, she didn't have coping skills. She was in two different apartments that were not modified for a little person. Plus, she had disabilities on top of it. She wasn't educated. She needed medical attention. I mean, it all stems from the re-aging. And Natalia, of course, has always said that she wasn't the age they said, despite yeah. the fact that she told people that. So our fascination, I think, comes from trying to figure out who's telling the truth, what jurors do every day in courtrooms around the country. They hear from two different sides and they try to figure out what's the truth. What are the facts that we're going to believe and rely on to come to a verdict? Well, it's sort of we're kind of like 13th jurors. You know, we know more than Michael's jury knew because we know all yeah. about the age issue. The jury didn't. And we're trying to figure out we heard Michael's side. He's clearly. He's got some problems as a storyteller. You know, he's yeah. not that reliable. He's made for reality television. Michael, I cover a lot of reality television. This guy is a reality television star. Unfortunately, he is a real life person. And the part one of this docuseries in May, we got to see his trial and that he got off and he was celebrating. It was a big victory. And he is back to continue his Michael Barnettisms in part two. But I'm so happy Natalia has a voice this time as well. Yes. And it's so important to listen to her because she takes on on some of the things that Michael says. And he stands by what he says, and she's adamant that he's wrong. I don't want to give away, so you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to give it away for your listeners and viewers who haven't seen it yet, but you're going to hear a point counterpoint, and you're going to hear new stuff of, about abuse come out of Natalia's yeah. mouth. It's really, you know, it's, it is a ride, as you said, a, yet another ride. Well, it is interesting when you give somebody a voice, you immediately lock into a story. And it was so, so important to have Natalia a part of this. And I think that's what really makes this very special because, you know, the first episode immediately she's talking, you know, she doesn't appear to be a monster like we had heard all of these stories and the story gets revealed little by little. And it just shows us today with media and things of that nature, how we can be presented a narrative and fully believe it and want to believe it like it's almost more exciting to believe that she was lying about her age this was like the movie orphan and that just gets your mind like kind of ablaze 
That's right. Yep. Um, well, that could bring us in a whole new direction in terms of talking about where we get our news and how we pick and <laughs> choose what we read and, you know, and all these things that, you know, frame the, the, the way we think. But here we're trying to give as many facts as possible and let people make up their own minds. Not everybody's going to agree. There are certain questions that are going to get answered, but not all questions get answered in, in this because we, we don't hear from Christine, right? She's not cooperating. So what we know about Christine comes from Natalia and comes from Michael. And they're on the same page on some things and not on others. Uh, we also have uh, messaging between Michael and Christine so we can get inside her head a little bit. And we try to take her conduct and things she said or wrote, texted, whatever, emailed, uh, and try to, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what you do in a trial. I mean, you can't get inside yeah. someone's head. You take all the conduct and try to figure out what their intent or whatever their state of mind was. So that's what we're doing here. What fascinates you still after all of this time about the legal process? What keeps you intrigued and being able to explain it to us? Because sometimes I hear about this. I want to throw my hands in the air. How do you keep coming back to this when you see all sides? You're trying to stay our reliable narrator. How do you do that as a professional? So you're talking about this case in particular or in general? Well, this case, but also you can in general, because you cover a lot of high profile cases. Yeah. I, I've seen a lot of your stuff through the, you know, in the past. How, how do you stay uh, focused? So uh, first of all, I love the courtroom and I love the law. And uh, let me take the general question first. Um, you know, I was 19 years at Court TV after yeah. being an assistant DA for eight years in Manhattan, where I am. Um, and it's the same formula, right? I mean, for every every trial, you know, a jury gets selected, opening statements, put on the evidence, defense puts on their <laughs> side, closing arguments, and there's a verdict. You'd think after, I mean, year after year, I did it for two decades, that I would have tired of it. Yeah. Never, right? Because every case is different. I have told people over the years, and it is absolutely true, that there's no greater drama that unfolds in America like what happens in a courtroom. Lives are changed in courtrooms every day. Somebody gets sentenced to life or to death and, you know, there's vindication and, and victims give their impact statements at sentence. I mean, it's just, it, it, courtrooms are, are theater. They are yeah, theater. It's gladiators almost of, like you said, like certain things in the first part were not be able to present to the jury, but us, the audience at home, thanks to ID discovery and things of this nature, we get a fuller scope. And yes. that I think is sometimes the confusing part about the legal system for me and the viewers is why do we get all of this information and where it really counts, they don't. Okay, good question. And I have said over and over, and forgive me if I, if you've heard me say this before, but people think a trial is a search for the truth. Well, it's a search for the truth under the rules of evidence. Judges will keep out certain evidence. It's just too prejudicial. If jurors learn this, then they're going to convict on that, not on the evidence, the, you know, the more important, more relevant evidence, whatever. And, and, and the judge kept out the age issue saying there yeah. is an, in Natalia's case, there's an order from an Indiana judge saying her age is 22, that she was born in 1989, not 2003. I'm not going to let you relitigate that. Half of the criminal charges against Michael and Christine had to do with neglect and abandonment of a child, right? It was yeah. based on her age and all those charges got dismissed because the judge said, I'm not going to let you do that. So um, we know more than the jury did because yeah. we don't have to follow those rules of evidence. We, you know, we can talk about the whole age thing. Although Natalia does bring it up to Michael and he won't go there, but. I yeah. won't say more than that. You got to no, watch it. No, and it's a fat guys. What she's talking about is a fascinating scene. I, it really does pop. I think that's what actually makes it intriguing is a real human behavior. And especially from Michael, who really exhibits a lot of uh, behavior in the course of this. But I was thinking when you watch this back and when you're presented with this story for season two, what I found very powerful is actually finally hearing Natalia's story and watching her discover certain pieces of her life that she had not known before. Was that uh, was that powerful for you as well? Oh, absolutely. And you know, when this was first pitched as a special, when we learned Natalia would speak, it was going to be a two hour special on ID at the end of the summer. That's what yeah, was. I remember. I was waiting for it. Right. Well, because more material was coming yeah. in and more people who couldn't talk before were agreeing to be interviewed. And we realized, oh, no, this is like we can get this is six hours. We can't truncate everything we know into two hours. That's not fair. You know, we need to put some of the corroborating evidence out there for some of the things that Natalia said. So it's six, you know, it's six very full episodes. Um 
but I think I lost my train of thought beyond that. No, it was just like, did you find this story like really powerful when they were uncovering, you know, we get to see pictures of her as a, a little kid, that, so, pictures that she had never seen before. And I found it very powerful to watch her see these things for the first time in some cases. Absolutely. Oh, I know what I wanted to mention. Sometimes when a person is crying on camera, viewers will say, well, I didn't see any tears. That wasn't yeah, real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're going to see tears with Natalia. The yeah. tears are there and you see the wet stain on her shirt, you know, and they cut back to her and she had been crying. I mean, you see the tears. I mean, she is crying in the camera. She is reliving as she talks about some of these experiences. She's reliving it or, as you just mentioned, she's seeing something new and is and is reacting. So um, it's pretty genuine. Yeah, no, it's very genuine. And, and it, you know, it was very interesting. She got passed around like a hot potato at a very young age, something that a lot of us have never experienced. And that's really that's tr traumatic in a way that is obviously going to stay with her. And she's seems like she's wound up with, uh, you know, the, the people that, you know, uh, are her, you know, that, that are her custodians right now. She seems like she's with a good family who we get to meet as well. Um, but it is interesting because we just were so questioning. Like I was so shocked in that first episode. She's saying full sentences. She's explaining her side of the story. And I'm like, okay, this all finally puts that all together. And that became a different story for me. I was like wanting the, oh my God, she is over their bed with a knife. And she even says, I'm not tall enough to be over their bed with a knife. Right. And also just physically look at her face compared to the pictures yes. from season one, the videos that were taken by Christine or Michael on their phones. She's a very different person today, right? Physically. Yeah. Looking. Yeah. Well, and just to remind people on part one, and I don't think this is giving anything away, is that they rehomed her at a very young age, making her live by herself. And we saw footage of Michael coming over and questioning where she got the donuts and this and that. And it was really rough. But if you in your head think, oh, she's much older than she is, you're like, maybe. But then I think this new series adds definitive proof that you cannot argue that she was the very young age that she actually is when all of this happened. And that blows me away is that this is definitive proof. And that kind of throws it into a whole nother category for me, which led to just a ama an amazing docu-series. Can you imagine like any eight or nine year old being sent no. to on their own? No, no. school. They, 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 they gotta take care of themselves. They gotta clean themselves and wash their clothes and cook and go grocery shopping and make sure they're getting their benefits because she got government benefits, SSI benefits. I mean, like, they don't have the coping skills. Oh my God. I wet the bed until I was 11. Are you kidding me? I couldn't even take care of myself. Like it was really interesting to see, but also horrifying. If you actually think about the reality of that situation for Natalia and also the anger in which she must have, because it must've been so confusing when you are a young person trying to deal with emotions and then not knowing where your real home is, why you're not being taken care of. The other thing this docu-series actually answers a lot of is the first part has some questions about potential behavior in a backyard where she might have doing uh, uh, certain sexual things uh, because a neighbor was told or this or that. And I found that because I heard that in the first part and I was like, how do you argue this? But the second part actually answers some of this and you start to think about, what people actual rem actually remember, how stories get passed down the line. And I thought that was interesting as well. Absolutely. So you'll see, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, that um, season two will do like flashbacks to season one so you, to refresh your recollection of what was said. And then Natalia's version or, you know, vice versa, Natalia says that we flash back to how it was portrayed. And so, you know, the viewer and listener has to decide Who's, te who's telling the truth. But I do think that we have corroboration now for the truth on a lot of questions. There, there are still some unanswered questions, but yeah. you haven't seen episode six yet. So, you know, we could talk again after you have. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I call you after I see episode six yeah, and we'll just wrap yeah, about yeah, it? Yeah, sure. You can get my contact information. <laughs> That's great. ID. <laughs> um, so the other powerful thing, which I, we were talking about before we started recording was the Christine of it all. So just to refresh your memories, Michael and Christine, they adopted Natalia. They split up. It was a very contentious split. A lot of things, you know, still probably going on with that relationship. And we see Michael very performatively acting very upset about the whole thing. But there were so many questions about Christine. And I, I loved about the second part was just reminding us that they had a very 
gifted son. They have a very gifted son that she wrote a book about that was going to be turned into a movie with Rosamund Pike. Uh, it was a huge advance, I think like $600,000, all of these things, which uh, allegedly uh, Christine kept all of that money. And it's put in there that they thought potentially they could do the same thing with Natalia, that it, this might not have been just for the good and kindness uh, through their hearts. This was actually potentially another revenue stream until they realized they don't have the power to gift somebody insane intelligence. That was fascinating. Yeah, that's uh, we don't hear from Christine. And so that's what Michael says. And there's a lot of evidence that seems to point to that being Christine's motive here, wanting a special needs child like her eldest, Jacob, uh, that she could then turn into a genius. She didn't turn Jacob into a genius. He was yeah. given like a book when he was 10 months old in his crib. I think this comes out in season one or maybe I know it from. Yeah. Outtake. He taught himself the alphabet at 10 months old, right? I mean, so, I mean, he's in college by the time he's 11 or 12, right? And he's like a physicist now. So, um, and at a very young age. So Natalia was a very average student, uh, not dumb, but not a genius. She's just an average student. And she, but she yeah. needed a lot of uh, med medical treatment. She needed surgeries. And they, not all of them were going to be covered by insurance. And she was becoming an albatross around their neck. She was going to be a um, financial drain. And if, if uh, it, so the theory goes, if Christine couldn't make money off of Natalia, then she wasn't going to spend her money, the book advance money, a movie deal money uh, on Natalia. She was going to just kind of get rid of her somehow and preserve no, her I reputation. Well, which right now I would imagine her reputation isn't that great as more and more uh, more of the truth comes out and people look into this case. I mean, do we have any uh, sense of where Christine is or how she responded to the first season in May? Um, she uh, said something like it was whacked, like the season. It was she yeah, had something derogatory to say about season one. And I think she's still in Canada, but I'm not in touch with her or her attorney. So um, I could find out for you. But I think she's not in Indiana. Um, and she's still in Canada because Jacob is still up there. I mean, he lives with his father like, yeah. like in the summer or whatever. But he's still he's still like working or going to school up in Canada or working or something. So um and the other two kids, the other two boys are still with her. And uh, according to Michael, she kept all of that advance money. It was Michael's job to support the family, uh, but she got to keep all the advance money. He really paints a very evil picture of her in season two. But she um, she wasn't happy with the series, but as far as I know, it's she never did anything further than post a few things about it. From a legal aspect, is all legal... Um dealings with this case completely over? Is there anything that could be brought against Michael and Christine from this point on? Um, I don't believe criminally anything could be because the charges were dismissed against her with prejudice and Michael's yeah. been acquitted. Uh, in the civil realm, you know, I think Natalia's exploring a few things um, and she's looking into uh, getting her age corrected, you know, back down again. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I don't know where those are right now. Because I would say, I was like, gosh, if they, 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 this is what, why it's weird when it come, kind of comes into this pop culture sphere where you almost take it as a show instead of reality. Because I'm like, oh, season three, we get Christine involved. We, we, Christine <laughs> speaks like we do. And it's yeah, weird because you so. almost get excited about this when it's really, you know, the important thing is for Natalia to speak, which this does brilliantly, is finally hearing her story because we've never gotten to hear it from before. Right, right. Yeah, you know, OK, so people are entertained by this whole story, but you're right. It is it's not it's not entertainment. It's informative. Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, we're shining a light on a horrible situation uh, and, and, and really it may be. The the only way for Natalia to get some justice is to let the court of public opinion, let the public know what happened to her, since there's no criminal court that's going to do anything. And I don't know about the civil courts. I mean, there may be some things she's pursuing, but this is a way for her to get some sort of justice is let people know the story. Do you pay attention to the response of these things? Because I was thinking that I was kind of excited for Natalia for people to see this and their reactions to this, because I think towards Natalia, it's going to be very positive. Do you do you pay attention to these things? And are you excited for that? 
Um, I do pay some attention, but I, I'm so busy with other projects too that I don't take the time. And I love to read books, so I read a lot. So, um, <laughs> but um, but I am informed by other people too who will say, "No, you got to read this." You got and and I was when season one aired on ID in um, in May. I I actually was on Twitter watching. You know, I was watching the feed. Yeah. Uh, the prosecutor Jackie Starbuck, she she was posting. She wasn't with us at the time. She hadn't agreed to talk, but she was posting and and you know talking about things. Oh, Michael said this. He never told me that. Oh, these people from the hospital <laughs> said that. I never heard. I mean, I screenshot a lot of her comments because I didn't know that we'd ever talked to her, and I thought we got to save these comments because these are her yeah. words. Um. So that was really, and I'll probably do that. January for yeah. a second when this airs. I'm I'm really excited to see the reaction of this because I think people are going to really it's going to blow their minds in a lot of ways after seeing part one because I I got to tell you again I went into part two still kind of going I don't know what this could be and it does a really it's a clear definitive answer for a lot of the questions that everybody's going to have in their minds. Um, going back to Court TV where you started from, could you ever predict where we would be now in terms of Docu series being making uh, being made over cases, the day to day uh, news feed on terms of just cases. Could you have predicted this? No, no, absolutely not. And I was talking earlier today about how I covered Scott Peterson's trial in yeah. California in 2004. And the, I lived in a hotel in Palo Alto that summer and well, the, for the six months. But that summer, Mark Zuckerberg was in Palo Alto also developing Facebook. And Twitter was developed like a year later. So that was one of the last big trials I did before there was any social media where you could like post in real time. And I was like, yeah. I was reading uh, snippets of what was happening in the courtroom that were coming to my Blackberry. I was reading on air. There was no camera in the courtroom. Anyway, I could never have envisioned. And then, you know, when Making a Murderer comes out in 10 episodes. Right. Netflix. People were riveted. That was kind of the beginning. It was like, oh, wow. The public will has a long attention span for a serialized story. So all of a sudden, all these long series come out. So, yeah, I mean, I've watched it all unfold. I've been in the crime space as a prosecutor or reporter, journalist for since 1986. Okay. So a long yeah. time. Um, yeah. and yeah, I've seen a lot of changes, but, um, they're good. They're well, good so, I mean, you're a star in this field. Like that's, what's interesting <laughs> is that, well, no, but that's, what's interesting is that we make the, like you, like I was like, I know, I know exactly who you are. I've watched that, well, so many things that you've done. And it is interesting because the darkness in which you have to cover and which you associate with at the same time, we've, you know, we make these people stars. I mean, even with the Scott Peterson, there are still people that are like, you know, I, I love them. I have a crush on them. Like all of these wild things when they're in TV, when we're talking right. about them, there's right. a star-like quality. People get confused nowadays. Yeah, I really like to think of myself as a messenger. I never, I don't, I don't think of myself as a star. People meet me, they say, "Oh, you're much shorter." I'm five two. <laughs> you're much shorter than you look on TV. I'm like, "What are you talking about? This is what you see on TV, mid chest of the head." <laughs> and I tell them it's because I have a ten foot personality. That's what I say. <laughs> they think I'm taller, but um, you know, I'm I'm a messenger. I consider myself a teacher. I loved. I love doing the analysis and explaining to people. It's yeah. what a teacher does. You know, maybe I should be teaching. I don't know. But well, I'm you are teaching. As long we, as people want to watch. <laughs> yeah, no, we do. We want to keep watching you. We want to keep watching this. And um, uh, what was the best thing about this second part for you in covering it? Was there a moment that really just affected you, good or bad, that has stays with you? Because you've done so many of these and covered so many things. Is there one that sticks out for you with this project? Well, I mean, episode six really stands out for me. So you'll have to wait. You keep teasing this episode now. six because you know I haven't seen it. You no, keep I mean, teasing yeah, it. I mean, that, that's <laughs> the truth, though. But um, I did like the, the, some of the corroborating evidence for Natalia's position. That was really important to me. But um, I did come away from the whole season still having some questions, even though even though some some of the key ones are <clears throat> excuse me are answered. I still have questions. And you're but that's how life me. is. I'm telling you, you're going to. I know me. that's <laughs> <laughs> like Beth. I need the ten foot personality to tell me what is going on right now. Um, I think you have a great relationship with ID Discovery, and looking forward to 2024. Are there cases that you are potentially covering for them? I was thinking. I was looking at the you know docket in terms of you know we have the Idaho killer case that would maybe be starting. Are there other projects that you have your eye on that you can actually walk us through in this format? So there. are aren't projects 
that I that I can talk about right now for ID, yeah. but I'll tell you, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be in them. What happens is I'm kind of like a cleanup batter. What yeah. happens, these guys, they they bring me in sort of when they <laughs> have the story like laid out, but they yeah. say, no, 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 we need to, we need somebody to string it all together and, and make sense. Oh, let's go get Beth Karras. And then they bring me in and I'm like, oh, okay. And I, they're like, well, this, we're coming off of this soundbite. We need to throw to that. And I say, oh yeah, I can get you there. And I explain what just happened. Yeah. And how we're, yes. so sometimes I get asked a little bit later in the game, not at the beginning. So I sh could be popping up on ID. I know there's one maybe you, coming up in February, but I don't think I'm at liberty to talk about it yet. But anyway, yeah. there could be more. I just don't know it yet. When I know no, it, I think you will be. And we see that in part two and even in part one is that, that you'll watch a clip of what they've filmed already and you'll explain to us what we just saw and add yeah. your expert advice. And right. I think that's necessary. It's that cohesion that actually takes scene to scene and walks us. It gives us that roadmap. And that's why it has to be you. Like I keep using that. I use it in reality TV a lot, the reliable narrator, because if somebody we don't trust says things, we just throw it out. We need somebody that we can trust. I, maybe I should hire you to be my agent. Okay. <laughs> let's make some deals. By the way, ID Discovery, are you on the line? Let's talk. We yeah, let's talk Turkey right now. Give them a let's call, talk. Okay? Okay. <laughs> let's. We're looking at the docket right now. No, I just think this is what you do is so uh, is is sometimes the unsung hero of the whole project, but it's the most important part of the project because you you know. You know, Mike, Michael Barnett, he'll, he'll wax poetic about anything or my, you know, like he'll, he'll go off. He'll be, you know, he'll, he'll use tears. He'll use his voice, big, bold, you know, but we need a calming uh, voice to walk us through what we just saw, because if not, it wouldn't be grounded in any sort of reality. Ah, but the operative word you just used in that statement is calming. I'm not always calm when I'm talking. Like I'm using my well, hand. Compared to Michael, compared down. to Michael, compared it's to special. Michael, you are very calming. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, in terms of this, as we start winding down, have you met Michael or Natalia in person? I have not. Those interviews were done by producers in Indiana. I've been back here yeah. and watched, you know, all the raw footage, but I have not met them. I would love to. But, you know, that's, you know, maybe someday I will. Um, Has he ever reached out to you in any form? Like no, a there was a woman, one of the one of the uh, women who was interviewed in seasons one and two, a neighbor, a neighbor in the Westfield apartment, the first apartment she lived in. Uh, oh, yeah. The one who said um, that Natalia, it was like living next to her was like living in a Hitchcock film or something. Uh, yeah. She reached out to me, but I I had to pass her on to the producers because my role was not to engage, you know, with the with the people, other people. That was their job was to engage in the people who were interviewed for the series. But yeah. Michael has not reached out. OK, good. Uh, and, and by the way, if he did, you probably wouldn't really be able to, like, go back and forth with him to stay, you know, put yeah. that over to the producers. Yeah. He um, had a good lawyer, though. You would agree, right? He had a good oh lawyer. Oh, my gosh. His lawyer. And, and that's another fascinating scene because his lawyer from the first part pops back up and he has some very interesting conversations and actually argues a very interesting point, I believe, in episode five, if I'm not mistaken, four or five that actually did make me think. Uh, still about Natalia's pattern of her own behavior. Um, so I found him to be highly effective compared to Michael, you know, as well. But um, uh, the other thing is, you know, you're talking about a, a, your own way and how you approach these things. How long did it take you to get to the place where you are now in terms of how you handle information, how you deal with it, how you process it and how you give it back to us? Have you did you used to start more sensational like 20 years ago and now it's changed a little bit? So you're talking about overall, not just this. Case. Yeah, overall. I started at Core TV in 1994, and I think I was really in a groove within a couple of years, like really comfortable on air. But and I would synthesize information for jurors, like I mean, for for viewers, where I would I would hear testimony and I would say, "Remember that witness yesterday and what you just heard? Here's how it all goes together." I would, and I used to have like the lawyers on the cases would say, "You know this case better than I do." <laughs> and then I've had lawyers ask for advice, which I can't. I, they, they want advice. What witness should I call next? Will you help me with my summation? I could never do any of that. But I, they've asked me this. So I got like I was I was another person. I was another lawyer in the courtroom almost because I would study the case at night and I would whatever documents I had. So 
the more complicated a case was, the more the size forensic evidence, I loved it. Like putting a piece of puzzle together. I loved all the, the more complicated, the better for me because I loved explaining it. I, I don't know where it comes from, but I just, it's just like my strength. I yeah, love it. I mean, it's not even I, work. I, it's not even work. Well, I no, that it. I mean that's a, my old teachers. You just you know find something that you you love and you'll never work a day in your life, which yeah. we've heard so many times. And it's so amazing that you love this. But do you ever being an assistant DA in Manhattan of all places? Did you do you ever miss actually being active, like being on the field itself? Yeah, I do. I do. I just um, you know I, I only did it for eight years, and four years I did street crime. You know all the you know, violent yeah. stuff, and then for four years I did organized crime and political corrupt political corruption investigations. I kind of regret not doing the violent stuff for eight years only because my career went off in the direction it did. Um, and I was, you know, in courtrooms all over the country covering murder and mayhem. So, but it's good, you know, the investigative stuff gave me tools that I wouldn't, in skills that I wouldn't have had. You know, you rise to the level of your adversary, right? And that's in any sporting event. You're going to play t better tennis if you're against a better player. You know, so I rose to the level of my adversary. I was against some top lawyers in New York City when I was doing organized crime stuff, you can imagine, right? So yeah. it probably made me become a better lawyer. But now, you know, I was just talking a little while ago about how I'm thinking about reactivating my license, you know, and maybe doing something. We need some you now more than ever. We need we need you on the field. We need you on the field. Yeah. But, uh, two I mean, last questions. Like but I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, two last questions. Do you still believe in our legal system as a whole? I do think that our system is 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 better than any other. Right. It's not perfect, but I think it's better. We need to constantly keep working at it. And, um, you know, I think our jury system is is solid enough. There, there are mistakes. Prosecutors and police are not in the business of arresting and prosecuting innocent people. It does happen. I, I, I am a huge supporter of the innocence projects around the country and have, I, I wrote, I, I've written articles about yeah. people in the innocence project. So, um, but I do think it's, it's a good, I still believe in the system. I have to, what are we going to do? What do we, we have to, we have to work with the system. Listen, and I, I trust you. I'll believe in it if you believe in it. So, <laughs> you, but, oh, and then my. secondly, um, uh, lastly is what do you want, uh, us, the viewer, uh, or what do you hope the viewer takes away from the six part curious case of Natalia Grace and Natalia speaks as a viewer, how should we approach this? How do you hope, how do you hope we, uh, consume this? Well, first of all, if somebody's watching season two, you need to like refresh yourself on season one. Right? <laughs> yes, obviously. A little bit. I mean, you don't have to take the time to uh, watch the whole thing, but you know, maybe read a little bit about it. Maybe look a little bit on online social media just to remember some of the issues. But I hope that people uh, give Natalia a fair shake. I do not discard everything Michael's saying. I think Michael is truthful about some things. I, I hope viewers come away just with critical thinking and assessing and look, looking for triggers to give them a, a factors to give them reasons to believe or not believe Michael or Chris uh, or, or Natalia. I, I just, and I hope they get some of their questions answered and I promise you some will be, but not all. But that's, that's it's, life. It's really that's... still unfolding. Yeah. I, I, by the way, I didn't know there was a six part. So the fifth part ended it. I was like, that's how it ends. I was like, this is wild. How does it end at the fifth part? So I'm so happy that the six part ex exists and I'm so happy to get to talk to you. It really is. And I know we shouldn't make stars of any of the political system, but uh, the, I mean, the courtroom system, but I, it has been such a pleasure to watch your career over these last couple of decades and just really an honor to talk to you because I've watched you so much on my screens and you've explained so much to me over the years. So thank you. And guys, January 1st, start your 2024 off the right way. Maybe a little weird, but the right way with the two part premiere of the curious case of Natalia Grace, Natalia Speaks. And then the following two nights, you get two episodes each night. And uh, that's the best way to start 2024. So Beth Karras, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ryan. And happy new year to you. Happy new year.